uh, ending the world drugs, I think there, there are two very good arguments. On the one hand, there is a philosophical argument talking about the right of individuals to be left alone. Jefferson um, spoke about it, the fact that the government's job is to keep people from hurting other people and essentially just get out of the way and let people live their lives. And I think that makes a lot of sense. And then there's also the, the practical argument uh, of the, the consequences of the war on drugs, the fact that it's doing more harm than good. Uh, addressing the first argument uh, about the, the principle, uh, which I think is important. We should always start with our principles and, and, and work from there. The principle is that, that we should have liberty. And I think the name of this group is, is, is great, Campaign for Liberty. And I think if you were to go out and, and speak to people, uh, particularly right, maybe say around the 4th of July, and you go out the, or, or Defenders Day, and you go out to Fort McHenry, and you say to the average American, you know, what's great about this country? And they would say, well, we have freedom and we have liberty. And when you, get, when you, when you start asking them the details on that and what that really means, uh, sometimes you don't get the best answers. I think sometimes people, let's say on the right, they see liberty as maybe the right to own a gun, which, you know, fair enough, the right to, to educate your children in the way you want to educate your children and, and pass on your values. And I think one, one could reasonably say that's, you know, fair enough at least. And, and before I go on, if, if I get off on the other issues besides drugs, I, I really am speaking in my personal capacity because I think it's important to say that law enforcement against prohibition members have uh, a wide degree of, of, of political views, and we're not a Republican, a Democratic, or a Libertarian organization. We're, 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 I think it's fair to say, all partisan. All, all people of all political stripes are, are welcome. But I, I think when we speak about liberty, I think you could say that, that you know, people on the left, they might speak about being left alone by the government, not having religion forced on them. And, and, and speaking to myself personally, I think I'd say, all right, fair enough. But very often when people say, they believe in liberty. They don't believe in liberty for you to do things that, that they really disapprove of, things that make them uh, uncomfortable, things that might seem dangerous. Because then, you know, they start saying, well, that, that shouldn't be allowed. We need a law on that. We need to ban that. And, you know, I think it's fair to say that I think most people on the right-left divide really don't understand liberty. They don't understand that you have a right to, to be left alone. And, and I apply that in, in drug policy uh, as much as any other, um, as much as anything else. That, that people have a right to essentially captain their own ship. Uh, and that people will make bad decisions. And, and I don't stand here pretending that, that people aren't going to make, that people don't and people aren't going to continue to make bad decisions with, with drug use. Uh, but the question is, do people have a right to make bad decisions or not? I, I think there is a, a very good acid test um, when, when talking with people and you're asking them if they believe in liberty, if the, is to ask them about the, the drug war. Because, you know, ultimately, you know, that's really what it comes down to is, is your relationship with yourself. Uh, in other words, your, your right to, to, to live your life and to consume substances in the privacy of your own home. And I think there's a very strong philosophical argument that, you know, if you're not hurting anyone, it may not be the best choice, and maybe we should have treatment available for people who want treatment, but we shouldn't be forcing people to live their lives in a way that they don't necessarily want to live them, provided they are not harming others. Um, but people have a gut reaction with drugs. They, they assume that if you are for legalizing drugs, that you must think drug use is great, that you want to legalize drugs because you want to go out and use drugs, and, and, and nonsense like that. I think we have moved the debate a lot in recent years where, where people are, are waking up and seeing the, the problems with the war on drugs uh, and, and the fact that it really is an infringement upon liberty. So I think it's, it's worth looking at it from that perspective. And I think that's something that anyone, even without experience in the criminal justice system and seeing the problems of the war on drugs, without, even if you don't understand the problems that the war on drugs creates, uh, you can at least in a sort of philosophical and theoretical level appreciate the, the argument in favor of liberty, that essentially you have a right to be left alone. Um, I want to just tell you a little bit about myself and about my experiences in law enforcement. I, I'm from, I, I live in Annapolis now, but I'm from the Baltimore County area. I grew up in Parkville and Perry Hall. I went to Loyola High School in, in Towson. Um, when I, um, I went to Loyola College up in Baltimore City. Uh, when, I was, when I was in college, I was trying to think, what am I going to do with my life? And uh, to be honest, I, I, I could probably tell you I knew I wanted to be a lawyer and I always wanted to be a lawyer, but that's, that's not true. In fact, I really didn't want to be a lawyer. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, 
But I needed to find something to do after, law, after college, and well, law school was there, and that seemed like a good alternative so, uh, to working. So I said, all right, I'll go to law school. So that's how I, I essentially got into the legal field. And it was something I was interested in in an academic uh, way. I was a history major, and, and law and history, I think, go hand in hand in many ways. Um, so when I was in law school, I, I, I still wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do with my life. And um, still not quite sure now either. But, um, <laughs> you know, when I was in law school, I, I, I probably, if you had said, you know, Bill, do you want to become a, a criminal lawyer? I probably said, no, I'm really more interested in business law and or torts or contract law. That's really kind of what I was more interested in. And, and if you said, Bill, do you want to be a prosecutor? I would have said, no, definitely not. I don't want to be a prosecutor. But I just really didn't have a, a great you know, fire in the belly to, to, to put people in jail. That's not uh, how I, I, I saw myself. That's not, uh, not something I, I really want to grow up. Uh, you know, so I, I know people who say, I've wanted to be a prosecutor ever since I was a little kid. I just I found that kind of depressing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not, not that there's anything wrong with being a prosecutor. I think it's, it's, it's an important job, but it's, it's, it's something we, I think we need in society. But... Um, it, it, I never felt the strong desire to, to put people in, in prison. So that's, uh, but I, I was looking for a job. This is probably not the most inspiring speech in the world, I realize that. But I was looking for a job, and I sent my resume around places, and, and Baltimore City State's Attorney's Office was nice enough to call me back. And I, I will forever <laughs> be grateful to uh, Patricia Jessamy and my, my friends in, in, in college, for hi who, was the state's, who was the state's attorney for Baltimore City who hired me. Uh, she was since defeated in an election, I think, in, what, 2010. Um, and, and my friends and colleagues in, in the state's attorney's office, because it, it gave me a, it gave me a um, not just opportunity to meet great people and, and to work in a, a job I really enjoyed, but to, to, to learn something about uh, the war on drugs and, and, and really the, the havoc that it was wrecking in society. Um, I started out my career in the, uh, in the state's attorney's office in the juvenile division, of the state's attorney's office in the circuit court. And basically, I don't want to make this a lecture about the juvenile courts. I could probably, just giving, explaining it to you, could probably spend a half hour. But basically, if you're a juvenile and you're charged with an offense, if you're under 18 and you're charged with a criminal offense, it, unless it's a very serious offense, it ends up in the juvenile court. The juvenile court is civil in nature. There are not uh, juries in, ju in juvenile court. Basically, your case is either heard by a juvenile court master, who is like a judge but not quite a judge, um, or a circuit court judge who is a judge. Um, and there are reasons why your case might be in front of a judge or a master that we don't need to get into. But it's an adversarial process. There's a, there's a prosecutor, and I was a prosecutor. There is a defense attorney. More often than not, it was a public defender, uh, though people could hire private attorneys and sometimes did for their, their kids. Um, but it, you know, you would contested trials, you would right of confrontation, all these rights that, that are important. Juveniles have; they just don't have a right to a jury trial because it's not a criminal in nature trial. But it's your your freedom can be taken away, not the same extent that your freedom can be taken away as an adult. But your freedom can be impaired, and therefore you do have certain due process rights as a juvenile. Um, when I was there, I would see kids. Um, I would say, well, most of my docket, I found, was, was made up of drug cases. And I would see kids, sometimes as young as 11 or 12, more often 13, 14, or 15, 16, uh, engaged in drug sales. They, they would be you know, basically kids in the inner city of Baltimore who were out there selling drugs. And you know, when I was prosecuting, I would see them as a problem. And I think most people would say they are the problem. You know, they're out there selling drugs, and selling drugs is not something you should do. It, it, it causes problems in society and all that. But thinking about it more, I would look at it and say, you know, these kids are really, in a sense, victims of their, their circumstances. Uh, they grew up in a world where, where this was uh, a somewhat normal activity. They grew up in a, in a neighborhood where the older drug dealers would get the younger kids. They would, you know, either willingly or unwillingly to go out there and sell drugs. Because if you're an adult drug dealer and you get caught selling drugs, you, your consequences for you are far more severe than if you were a juvenile. So they would basically get these kids to go out there and sell the drugs because nothing much would happen to them if, um, if they were arrested. And the money's good for them. The money's good for them, too. I, I don't think these kids made a whole lot of money. They, they, they thought the drug dealers made money off the kids. They got the mini bikes they ride right out there. <laughs> well, the mini bikes, yes. 
I, I don't know how expensive they are. I think you can get them off of uh, eBay reasonably cheap. They're not uh, Mercedes or drive around. <laughs> but uh, um, nevertheless, um, you know, I felt like, you know, these kids were in a world where none of their making, none of their choosing. And, you know, often if they didn't end up getting shot in the head by a rival gang, they would end up graduating to the adult drug system, adult court system, end up doing serious time in prison. Some of them did manage to turn their lives around and try to get out of that culture and, 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 and did something more uh, productive with their lives. But um, oftentimes for these kids, it, it was a dead end. And, and I think that's, that, that's a problem. Because when we hear the anti-drug <coughs> warrior people, the people who tell you we need to uh, stop drugs, very often they say it's, it's for the children. But I, I, I question, well, whose children? Because it's not, it's not these kids they're, they're fighting the drug war for. In fact, these kids are, are really losing. And if we had a system of regulation and, and legal trade in these uh, drugs, it, that the black market would be put out of business. Maybe these kids could have something more of a normal life um, than, than what they have now. So think about that when you, when you hear people talk about we have to do this for the children. Um, in fact, I think the argument is there that if we legalize drugs, we regulate them, uh, we, we know that kids are going to have less access to drugs because um, drug dealers don't ask for ID. Uh, you know, it's harder for kids to get tobacco and alcohol than it is for them to get marijuana. I, I think there's something to be said for the fact that not only are we going to protect these kids in inner city neighborhoods and getting them out of the drug trade, we're going to protect kids in suburban communities so they make them harder for them to get uh, drugs as well. So uh, don't listen to people when they tell you, well, when the people tell you it's for the children, just throw that right back at them. Uh, <laughs> well, I did reasonably well in my job in, in Baltimore City, uh, where, you know, being in government work, I only had to do reasonably well to get promoted. Uh, but <laughs> uh, and, and soon enough, I, I was promoted, uh, I'm dropping pens here, if I, I just move this around a little bit, um, to the misdemeanor jury trial division of the circuit court. Now, again, I don't know, I don't want to spend all night explaining the uh, details of the circuit court system to you, but basically what that meant was if you're charged with a, uh, most offenses in Maryland, if you're charged with a misdemeanor offense, let's say that, or some felonies, your, your case ends up or starts up in the district court. The district court is the lower level of trial court. In the district court, your case is decided by a judge. You don't have a jury trial in the district court. But if you want to, if your offense carries more than 90 days, you can have an automatic right to have a jury trial. So you can say, yes, I'd like a jury trial. I'd like to go to the circuit court. If your, if your offense carries less than 90 days and you're found guilty by the judge, you can appeal your case and you can have a jury trial in the circuit court. So a lot of district court cases ended up in the circuit court. A lot of people were asking for jury trials in Baltimore City. Not because they necessarily wanted a jury trial, but because they knew they could get a better result with a plea in the circuit court. I think sometimes, um, well, I could speculate as to the reasons, but it seemed to be that people got better results, better plea offers in the circuit court. I think one of that, one of the reasons is if everyone kind of gets together in the district court and says, gee, we'd like to have a, a jury trial, and the circuit court gets overrun of these jury trial prayers, they start saying, we can't try all these cases. We've got to start making better plea offers for people. Um, so when I was doing this work, I, I would very often get a, a, a caseload of 30 40 cases I would have to prepare for the next day, not knowing who was really serious about wanting a jury trial and who just would take a better plea offer. Uh, so it, it took, it was actually a fairly stressful job, but it was a lot of fun because you, you had to be on your, your toes about it. I found that the bulk of my docket was taken up with um, drug cases. And there were two types of drug cases. There were the misdemeanor drug cases. There was a, you know, this was back in 2005 when, 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 I think it was then Mayor O'Malley was, was having the police basically round up everyone. So they would find, you know, everyone walking down the street, search them and, you know, find drugs on them and, <laughs> and arrest them. Um, you know, and, and, you know, obviously there, there are problems with that. That's not a, a, a good way to uh, police. And I think there have been some changes since then. But I would get tons of cases where just people who had a drug a addiction who were arrested, taken into custody. Um, and, you know, more often than not, they'd end up with a time-served sentence anyway. Uh, sometimes if they were on probation, there could be more serious consequences for them. But it was kind of a, a catch-and-release scheme for the most part. Uh, the people who were caught and released never really got any help. The people who were caught and put in jail never got really any help either. So uh, I, I didn't think either way it was, it was really doing anyone any good. The other type of case that we saw in Baltimore City, which I don't know how often how common this is elsewhere, but... 
in Baltimore, they had so many drug distribution cases, they would charge many of the drug distribution cases as attempted distribution. Well, the reason that's relevant, even though it carries the same penalty, attempt, attempted distribution is a misdemeanor. So the case would end, start up in the, in the district court, and it was basically kind of a, a way to ease the caseload. And it does make you wonder that if you have so many drug distribution cases in Baltimore, that you have to start charging felony distribution cases as misdemeanor distribution cases just to cut down on the caseload, because the felony courts couldn't handle that level of cases, what is really being accomplished? And of course, you know, not much. But <laughs> it was a... It, it was a, a, a good experience to see firsthand the, the types of problems that people had. I, I didn't grow up in, in inner city in ba inner city Baltimore. I, did, I you know, was aware of the, the war on drugs and the problems that people had, but you know, seeing firsthand the, 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 the problems that, that were created by the war on drugs and the problems that people had and, and seeing how you know, lot their lives were, it was really kind of an eye-opening experience for me and got me thinking that, you know, this, this drug war is, is a bad idea, and I need to speak out more against it. Um, my education continued uh, being promoted once more in the state's attorney's office to the felony trial division, where I was handling robberies, stabbings, some shootings, uh, and a lot of burglary cases. And what I found in a lot of burglary cases, pretty much every burglary case, and a good amount of the robbery cases, and, and I think some people don't understand the difference between burglary and robbery. Burglary is when you go on someone's property, usually a house or, 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 or a store or something like that. Robbery is when a person comes up to you and force or the threat of force tries to take your property. Uh, and I would see a lot of these cases where the people had rather serious drug addictions, usually the heroin, sometimes the cocaine. And, of course, I'm, I'm of two minds of this. I mean, you can't, you can't tolerate people going into people's houses, taking their property. You can't tolerate people putting a gun in someone's head, face and, and taking their stuff. Uh, that's wrong, and those people need to be punished for, for doing that. <coughs> On the other hand, I did feel like there was a, a benefit to, instead of just long-term incarceration for people, of, of perhaps getting in the, into treatment when it was appropriate, when the, when the record was not that terrible, when there was uh, perhaps some mitigating circumstances, that just not throwing away the... the, the the book, throwing the book at someone, throwing, it, throwing them in jail and throwing away the key was not always the best solution. Sometimes it was. I mean, if you have someone who is a, a predator who, who, who takes advantage of weaker people in society, I think it's certainly right and just that you would want to prosecute that person and have that person, you know, serve some time. But I think it's also, and I felt then, that it was worth trying to get people into treatment when that would work. Um, the other aspect of that was, you know, I started thinking more and more about whether or not a heroin prescription plan or something like that might, might work. And I have seen uh, methadone treatment work with a lot of people who are heroin addicts. And methadone is basically a synthetic heroin. Um, and it's not the best solution. It's not, it's not a great solution to get people off of uh, one drug and put, put them on another drug. But when I see people able to live their lives and not commit new offenses to support their habit, it seems to make a lot of sense. And I, I think a heroin prescription plan perhaps funded by a, a private charity or, or the government or, or someone, uh, might make more sense than um, a, a prohibition scheme, which is essentially uh, not working. I, I see this uh, very often where you get someone who, you know, drug addicts are, 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 are not these people who are living, um, you know, under a bridge somewhere. They're not, you know... They're not trolls, okay? You know, they're, they're, they're people just like you or me. And I've seen people who are, um, you know, they get injured, they get hurt, they maybe have dental surgery, they start getting addicted to painkillers, the doctor cuts them off the painkillers, they start buying the painkillers on the street, maybe they switch to uh, heroin, uh, they start selling their own belongings to support their, their habits, they, they, they start stealing from their family members to support their habits, and next thing you know, they're breaking into someone's house. And it becomes a, a cycle uh, that, you know, sometimes you can't do anything about it, but I, the, the prohibition of, of, of drugs and not being able to deal with drug, drugs in a more rational and reasonable way consistent with human freedom, I think is, I know is making the problem worse. And it's also making the problem worse because a lot of times these people will die of overdoses. When they buy drugs on the street, they don't know what they're getting. They don't know what the purity of it is. Um, I think if we, you know, the other thing I, I think, and I don't know if there's any science to this, but I, I really believe that one of the problems is once a person becomes addicted to, some, let's say, heroin, he, is, he or she is treated by society as an outcast. 
And I think once a person becomes alienated from society, he or she loses less of an interest in society and feels apart from it and doesn't feel as bad about trespassing against society. I think if the person can be mainstream, mainline, I don't know what the right term is, if the person can be helped in a way where we don't treat him as a, as a criminal just because he has a drug problem, that he's going to feel or she's going to feel as if he or she is a, por a part of society and not going to feel so willing or so, um, uh, f feel so comfortable about trans, uh, tra uh, transgressing on the rights of others. And I think that's, that's something that, that is not yet not thought about enough, but it's something worth considering. Um, so, you know, that was kind of my, that was my experience in the state's attorney's office. I, I, I left shortly, not shortly after, I spent about four, four years or so, uh, or about four years in the state's attorney's office in Baltimore, and I decided time was moved, time, it was time to move on. And I, I now defend people who are charged with um, criminal offenses, and that has been an eye-opening experience as well, because as a prosecutor, you don't really talk to the, in fact, you don't talk at all to the defendants. You hear them talk sometimes, but you don't, you don't interact with people, and so you don't get a sense of, of what their problems are and how they're thinking. And, and, and so it has been a useful experience being a defense attorney, uh, hopefully helping people, but also uh, uh, and making sure their rights are protected, but just getting an insight on, on, on the, the drug problem and the war on drugs. There is a, a general sense in society that there is something wrong with our criminal justice system. And I, I see it all the time when I read the newspaper and I read the letters to the editor, and the, the common thread seems to be that, you know, we're just letting people off. We're, we're, we're not putting anyone in jail, and that we just need to lock more people up. Well, I, I, I understand that way of thinking, and I'm not saying it's, it's completely illegitimate, but it is worth considering that we are the number one incarcerator of people in the world. We incarcerate not only more people than any other country, but a higher percentage of our population is in prison than any other people. So I think it's worth thinking, are there other ways of dealing with criminal justice problems, particularly the war on drugs? And that's what I'm here to talk about, not necessarily other criminal justice reforms. But uh, in the war on drugs, I think well, we, there is another way of thinking about it. And it is, uh, as I indicated, ending the war on drugs, legalizing and regulating drugs, I think it would cut down not only it would cut down crime, not just you know the cases where people are charged with possession and distribution, but it would actually make it easier to get people in the treatment. Uh, and, and I think it would cut down other crimes like burglaries, people trying to feed their habit, robberies, etc. So while I agree with people that there are serious problems with our criminal justice system, the answer is not just to pass more laws and, and lock more people up and, you know, really fight the drug war. I, I hear this sometimes from people who say, yeah, we really got to fight the drug war like they do in China, like they do in Singapore. I'm like, really, do you want to live in a world like that? I, I, I don't. Uh, you know, I'd like to live in a free society, not some, you know, totalitarian uh, society where the government controls every aspect of my life, where I think in Singapore they, 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 they actually subject the citizens to random drug tests. You know, I don't want to do that. <laughs> uh, you know, sorry, I, you know, I'll take a pass. If that's the choice between... <laughs> um, but, you know, there's... People are afraid when you, when you speak about drugs. And... and We've been so conditioned to, to think that, you know, this is the way it is and, and this is the way it, it always should be. And it's worth considering the, the, the facts. I mean, I, statistics are a dangerous, um, dangerous game. But I, I did see a statistic, and, and it's up, Leap has a, a citation for it, that in 1914, something about under 2%, before we had any federal drug laws, about less than 2% of the population was, you could consider addicts, people who were addicted to drugs. 1970s, when they started the whole war on drugs, it was under 2% who were addicted to you know, hardcore addicts to drugs. You know what the percentage is today? It's, it's under 2%. So millions of, billions of dollars spent, uh, countless lives ruined. And have we really, in any way, um, cut down the amount of drug use out there? And, and the answer appears to be, no, people have this idea that if we legalize drugs, that you know everyone's going to go out and start injecting heroin and smoking crack. Uh, everyone's going to start taking PCP. Your airline, <laughs> your airline pilot's going to be you know shooting up when he's he's flying your plane. Planes are going to crash out of the sky. The school bus driver's going to drive off the cliff, kill everyone. Uh, everyone's going to be zombies. And, and, and you know, questions: Is that reasonable? Is that how you would? Uh, how are we doing on time? Are we okay? Uh, okay. Well, let me just uh, you know I, I will 
I, I wasn't sure how long I was going to talk, but I want to just, just end with this. Um, the world is not going to end. And I think we have to step back and think that before 1914, we didn't have federal drug laws. It's worth saying that, you know, Newt Gingrich, um, I don't know, I'm sure everyone here knows Newt Gingrich, right? Um, <laughs> he, was, um, he was asked during the last campaign about two famous hemp farmers, Jefferson and Washington, about whether or not they would approve of people growing marijuana. And his quote, I think is really interesting, is, I think Jefferson or George Washington would have strongly discouraged you from growing marijuana, and their techniques for dealing with, dealing with it would have been rather more violent than the current government. Well, you know, <laughs> it's hard to imagine that a guy who's a history professor, a smart guy, doesn't know better. Now, I think he does. And why does he say that? Because people will believe him. I, I, it's, it's, it's the craziest thing in the world. I, people are terrified of drugs. And it's worth opening up the discussion and, 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 and thinking about it and having those discussions. Um, what can be done? Um, I think it's worth, you know, when, when you go and you speak to, uh, go to town hall meetings when your local representatives are there and you agree with me on this issue, raise the issue. Because if the, the politicians actually think that the people are changing their mind on this, they're going to change. And because and politicians are essentially, you know, cowards. I mean, some aren't, but most are. And they're going to do what they think the, the, the public, you know, wants. And so if they think, you know, people are changing their mind on this drug issue. I can't fear monitor on this issue anymore. Maybe I have to change my thinking on this. It's, it's going to work. And I think also just getting involved with law enforcement against prohibition. You can join as a supporting member. And, and just talking about it with, with your friends and, and your, your your family and, and, and just raising the issue. Look, I don't smoke drug, I don't smoke, you know, crack or marijuana, but I feel strongly about this drug issue. I think it's a, I think it's a personal freedom issue. And I'll just end on this. If you can't, you know, think about it. If you can't grow a plant in your garden, if you in the privacy of your own home can't consume a substance without harming someone else, without having to worry about the police breaking down your door, you know, are you really free? And I would suggest not really, no. And, and, and we want to be free. We want to have liberty. So I, I would hope you would make this a prime issue and, and fight for uh, legalization and, and reasonable regulation of drugs and ending the war on drugs. So questions? I, yeah. Do we have time for questions? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, um, um, yes, sir. Very good. Um, you spoke on legaliz legalizing um, all drugs yeah. and uh, maybe even implementing some sort of... Uh, Health program. Can you speak on any countries who have done this and maybe the successes that they have had in the decline of their drug usage or uh, crimes, drug-related crimes? Portugal is, has been cited. They kind of have this, they, they've kind of decriminalized drugs, but not really. Um, they don't, if they happen to catch you with a small amount of drugs, well, most of the time they'll leave you alone, but they happen to get you in the system. They kind of nag you into getting into treatment and, and, and not... You know, but they don't throw you in jail. They, they're not going to throw you in jail for, for using drugs. And, and drug use in Portugal is actually going down. Uh, not much. I mean, statistically, you know, it's maybe statistically insignificant. But it's worth saying when the, the authorities said, you know what, we're not going to throw everyone in jail for using drugs, that, that drug use didn't just skyrocket. Because most people, I think, are rational, reasonable actors. Holland, again, has kind of been playing around with this uh, uh, marijuana thing, and they're, they're back and forth a lot. There seems to be a fair degree of tolerance for it there, and they found that high school students in, in the Netherlands use marijuana at a lower rate than high school students here do. I mean, I, I should tell you something. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, they, they're, there are other examples as well, but let's um, go. Oh, you had your hand up first. You say that when you, if you legalize it, the black market will dry up. Uh, yeah, I just, I'm assuming that if you were to legalize it, there would be like a minimum age, like 18 or 21 or whatever. Yeah. At least for marijuana, wouldn't there still be a black market for those underage? To the extent that there's a, a black market for, for alcohol, um, you know, I, I think there's a, a, there's a trend. Uh, and, I, you know, there are smarter people than, than, than me have, have put together charts of this that show that when government regulation of, an industry, government regulation of the economy increases, um, that the black market also increases and that, Lowering regulation, less regulation, have less of a black market. I, there is, I think, certainly with alcohol, there there might be a small black market for alcohol. But because you, know, you can essentially go into any liquor store and buy alcohol, there's you know, some of you over 21, there's really not much of a black market. I, I, you know, personally speaking, I would say 18 is probably a more reasonable age. Uh, uh, I think you know, if you can vote and serve your country, I don't see why you couldn't make your own decisions about how you want to live your life. But 
Yeah, if we make it 21, there's going to be a black market in, but it's going to be harder for kids to get the drugs than it is now, and we're going to reduce most of the black market where it's not going to be a, a profitable big black market. Mm -hmm. uh, this, sir, you have a question. Yeah, my question is, uh, could be specifically so around, why has why have we seen some uh, movement towards legalization in Baltimore City? You had Kurt yeah. Schmoke, a mayor, a while back that seemed in favor of something like that. You had, you know, it's clear that. <clears throat> Uh, there's prejudice in the drug laws against the black population, which yeah. is, you know, very strong in Baltimore City. Yeah. And I'm curious if you if you have any quantitative information about what people actually think yeah. in Baltimore City. My guess is you get them more than half would say, you know, it shouldn't be. Illegal. Yeah, I, that was my experience. I, I didn't find you got two, you got all sorts of different people. I mean, the, the, the drug dealers are probably kind of happy in a way, <laughs> the way it is. You know, they're, they're doing okay. You know, assuming they don't go to prison, they're, they're doing okay. They have to get real jobs if they legalize. You do have the kind of community activists who may not put, you know, the, the, well, I don't want to say too much thought. They, they, their, their thought process is different than mine, who say, oh, we got to clean up this neighborhood, get drugs out of here. And I understand that, because it's not good when you have drug dealers in your neighborhood. I, I kind of sympathetic with that. Um, I have talked to many people who say, yeah, we, we should do something different, like legalize drugs. You, you do get that a lot, but you know the problem with Baltimore, Baltimore City just can't legalize drugs because I mean you know the police are enforcing state laws and it would be quite a thing if the Baltimore City police just said we're not going to enforce all these state laws. So we do need a statewide and, and national and even international change. But it, it would be useful, you know Baltimore you know is a, is a, Maryland's a great place or at least it used to be. Um, we we were the free state. We didn't pass a prohibition law during prohibition. Um, you know we. we you could legally drink under Maryland law, but not under federal law when we were during Prohibition. We, we produced uh, my, one of my heroes, H.L. Mencken, who was a you know, great champion of, of liberty. Uh, you know, we got Kurt Smoke, who's not quite H.L. Mencken, but he has something to contribute. Um, and, uh, and, and we have, you know, um, we got a lot of leap speakers seem to come out of Baltimore. It's, we, we seem to have a, 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 a high percentage of them, uh, of former prosecutors and cops who, who are involved with LEAP. And uh, so we, there is some reason to hope. It just hasn't um, materialized in a way that would produce a, a meaningful change yet. Um, I don't know who to choose. Uh, <laughs> how about uh, that, John? Right, here we go with that. Thank you. Um, how about government contractors who sell the various governments uh, these new militarized police vehicles, uh, surveillance equipment, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. Uh, private prisons. So you have a you have people who have vested interest to go to hire a lobbyist and, and promote these laws because they make a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, isn't it, a, it's, it seems to be the, the case, generally speaking, that if there's a special interest in their focus, they can get a lot more achieved than the public, if they're, even if they disagree, if they're unfocused. So it is worth saying, you know, look, as, as, as individuals, we're going to get involved in groups that believe in drug reform because these people do have a vested interest in keeping the system the way it is and escalating the war on drugs. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say everyone involved in the war on drugs is, is doing it because they, they, they want to benefit uh, from it financially, but I think a lot of people do. Um, and a lot of people support it for that reason. So it is worth getting involved in, in special interest groups such as LEAP. And there are other good drug reform organizations out there as well and, and making your voice heard. So, you know, politicians know that, you know, you know people out there care about this and sort of offset that special Yes, go ahead. You think the federal government in the black market drug trade since they grab so much of that money? Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. so many lawyers who yeah. so, um, make this function? You know, it's, it's funny. It, no, I mean, certainly there are vested interests in the federal government that want that. It's, it's funny when you say about employee lawyers because it's, it's, it's a good point, and, but and I think most people here would, would appreciate this point is when the government, you know, the government spends, takes your money, takes your freedom, and essentially creates a problem like drug prohibition. You know, then they take more money and more freedom and make the fight the problem, and it just makes the problem worse. Uh, when the government spends money on lawyers and prosecutors you know, and, and police and prisons and probation agents and judges and all these things, the, the criminal justice industrial complex, well, that's, that's creating jobs for those people, but it's taking money out of the economy that could be put to better use making people happier and more productive and, 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 and more creative uses and creating more jobs everywhere else. And it's sort of the seen and the unseen. The criminal justice industry creates jobs, but if you got rid of that or pared it down to its constitutional and moral size, those resources would go elsewhere and create more jobs. 
So it's worth making that point. Um, but you have to do an amateur first, and we'll go back. Yeah, so <coughs> what positive um, results have we seen from your involvement in the board? Uh, well, I think we, you know, um, personally seen, I, I, I wasn't in Colorado or Washington, but I know LEAP was involved <laughs> with those um, campaigns and added a lot of credibility to the campaign when you had people who were retired uh, chiefs of police and detectives and, and prosecutors who were coming out and saying, look, the war on drugs is a bad idea. This is a good start in trying to end it. Um, so I think LEAP contributed a lot to that. Um, I think it just adds credibility. That, look, I mean, for years, the people, well, I mean, I'm exaggerating a bit, but the, for years it was seen that the people who were advocating for ending the war on drugs were just a bunch of potheads or you know, drug addicts. And I think, like, think we add some credibility to the, the argument of, which, you know, obviously that generalization was not true, but that was kind of the impression people have. So I'm hoping we're adding to the impression that, no, this is actually serious stuff. It's a serious philosophical argument. And it's a serious practical, practical argument based on what we have seen firsthand. So it's just the educational component, which I think we're making some success with. Uh, Sir, you had your name first, and back to you. Um, you first. With your experience with the attitude of the people, um, how far off do you think we are, uh, say, in Maryland? Yeah. Um, as compared to Colorado and Washington. Yeah. And um, also, that's an interest um, in Colorado, you said, with the pharmaceutical industry, beer industry. How much do they, do they lobby, especially against recreational use of marijuana? Um, I hear that. I, I haven't looked at the numbers. Um, I'm sure they're involved to some extent, but I, you know, I, I, it's probably true that they are. I just don't know enough about that to say that they are the leading force, but, you know. Uh, I guess I'll Google that when I get home, but um, I have heard that, but I, I just don't know the details. Um, Maryland. Maryland is a, is a, is a, is a tough state. Um, while we have a great history of freedom, uh, we... Um, <laughs> not a recent history of freedom, but <laughs> um, You know, it, it's... Colorado, you could... In Washington, I think you have the ability to, for citizens to actually get up and like write an amendment to the Constitution. You just can't do that in Maryland. You, 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 can't, it's, you can challenge things if it was just recently, the law was recently passed, but you just can't go back and, and, and say we're going to rewrite this thing. But I looked into it. I was curious. Is there any way we can do something like Colorado or Maryland? And I looked up the law. I was like, no, I guess. <laughs> so you have to convince your legislatures. And, I, you know, I don't, I don't know if I have too much faith in them, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm sure there are probably some good ones out there, but, uh, um, you know, it's, you just got to go bang on their door and just say, hey, you know, this is a show I care about, and, and maybe something gets done. Well, the big thing they did last year uh, was they, they passed this law that said if you have this under X amount of marijuana, we're going to lower the penalty from one year to 90 days. And most people say, oh, that sounds great. We're lowering the penalty for marijuana. But when you think about what that is, think about what I said earlier, if, you're, if your offense, if the crime, the misdemeanor crime carries less than 90 days, you don't have an automatic right to a jury trial. So this was a way to just cut down on the, the jury trial prayers up the circuit court. So that was not a good piece of legislation. <laughs> that basically made it easier for a district, you know, if you're into marijuana, which I'm you know, not encouraging, but if you're into marijuana, it made it easier for a district court judge to throw you in jail for three months, and you can file your, your appeal bond, and you can file your appeal, and, and, and if you sit in an appeal line, you can post, you can file your habeas, but it makes it easier for the courts to put you in jail. So, I, I, yeah, that was our big reform last year. So, uh, uh, that gentleman back there first. And, and uh, in your time as a prosecutor, did you ever engage in, like, some kind of nullification to, like, just kind of help uh, people that would have otherwise been criminals? Um, I, as a prosecutor, it was not appropriate for me to nullify, but... Certainly, I had discretion in, in terms of who I would prosecute. And, I mean, I, I, when you have a volume of cases that you have in Baltimore, you're certainly allowed to use a fair amount of discretion. And if someone didn't have a horrendous record and, you know, I wasn't necessarily trying to put them in jail or even get a conviction, unless it, it, it seemed appropriate. And you kind of made those decisions on, on an individual basis. It was not my role to go in there and say, I'm against war on drugs. And, and I don't know if I completely formatted my, form my views to, to the intensity or to the, to the level I have now. So I didn't see it as my view to go in there and get people off of drug charges. That would have been inappropriate, and I would not have been doing my job. I, I used my discretion in a way I thought was fair. Um, but, you know, certainly as a defense attorney, I try to, um, you know, get people you know, out of jail or not get convictions. Uh, but jurors have the right to, to, to nullify. Uh, you know, you're not supposed to argue that to a jury. In fact, you, you, you really are not allowed to. It's one right we're not allowed to tell you about, basically. But it's Article 23 of the Constitution. It's Article 23 of the Constitution, yes. Uh, so it's, um, 
you know, and there's a long history of nullification with, with William Penn in the case of the seven bishops and, and other, you know, Fugitive Slave Act and things like that. It's worth looking into. But, um, you know, you, you have a right as a juror to, to use your own judgment. I'm not going to tell you that as a, an attorney, but, um, you know, it's there in the Constitution. It says, says that. Um, <laughs> despite the, the attempts to reinterpret that, it's, you know, it's, it's there and it's part of our history. And it's, it's, it's been used as a, the way to fight against tyranny. And it's certainly worth considering and, and meditating on, I should say. One of the reasons why the prohibition failed, because juries would not find anybody guilty of it anymore. That's, that's right. So that's, that's yeah. <laughs> something to consider. One more question. It's been the, uh, yes, sir. I just wanted to see, in your opinion, what was uh, the percent of the workload in, let's say, the district court of these kinds of charges, and how much do you think the court system would be cleaned up if you didn't have to deal with it? Um, well, my experience as a prosecutor is all in the circuit court, but um, I was kind of lucky to bypass the district court, which is, is, is um, full of adventure. But, uh, you know. but I, got, I got a similar experience as doing jury trial prayers. Um, we would have a lot more resources to deal with violent crime, property crime. I mean, I think it's, it's worth considering that resources of law enforcement are finite. Yeah, even though the federal government in the they tell you they can print as much money as they want. They're, they're finite budgets. And every dollar spent on going after some guy growing a marijuana plant in his backyard is a dollar not going after a you know, rapist or a, a child molester or a murderer. Yeah, control judge. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, worth, it, it's worth considering that, that what is the purpose of government? Why are we paying taxes? Are we paying taxes for the government to control our lives? Are we paying taxes to keep... So the government will keep people from hurting us so we can go live our lives. And that's really what it comes down to at the end of the day. So, any other questions? Thoughts? Maybe we have time? Now, just a comment. Sure. My, my uh, view on all this is when there's no injury, there's no crime. I agree. Liberty. I agree. Yeah. So, um, and during nullification, it is a real proper remedy for us to use today. So it's, a, it's a topic of discussion everywhere. Yeah. State nullification, you know. Yeah, not, but not going to argue with that. Also, if the citizenry would just wake up and use jury nullification, yeah. People have a, people have a conscience, and they have a right to use it. I'm not going to argue. I can't argue that. I mean, I'm not going to tell you on jury. To, but I'm, look, I'm not. I'm here as a private citizen. I, you know, you have a conscience. You can use it. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm just throwing it out there. I'm not not telling anyone what to do, but you, you have a right to make your own decisions. Um, About the depth of corruption within the government, as far as the idea of the CIA brings in. Baltimore, the cops and everybody handles it. I, Everybody's in on it. Yeah, look, I'm, I, it, it's, it's, we don't have enough time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let, me, let me just close with saying, um, I try my best to stay on topic. I know, again, I said this at the beginning, LEAP is a wide-ranging group of people. I think many of us would disagree on some of the details, but we agree on legalizing drugs, some degree of regulation. Um, we, we would disagree maybe on the details of that. Uh, if I went off topic on anything, I'm speaking my, my personal capacity, and I'm here speaking at my capacity as a LEAP speaker, so if I went off reservation with anything, uh, just my personal view. So, uh, but anyway, I, I think we're uh, yeah, a different time. Uh, LEAP.cc is our website, and um, it's LEAP.cc, and they're also on Facebook. If you just Google LEAP, if you, you know, you'll, you'll find it if you don't get the address. So I'll take questions afterwards, but I think we're stuck for time, aren't we? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.